Hi. Um, thanks to the organizers and thanks to almost all the speakers, the exception being the speakers who I unfortunately missed. So apologies uh, to them. Um, the conference has been excellent. Rick assured me that it would be OK to give an informal talk. I've sort of been out of the area. And, and based on my experience up until now, I, I, I have to conclude that that was a prank. Uh, I feel very, very, very out of place. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering if, if I, I'm actually starting to wonder if I did something to Rick, in which case I apologize. And, and now we can, can call it even. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a question that I have failed to answer. And I should say that Rick asking me to encouraging me to give this some formal talk has worked out very well for me. Because in trying to pull the talk together, I figured out a lot of things that I don't understand, and which I still don't understand. But I understand them. I misunderstand them better now. So it's been useful for me. You may find yourselves not thanking Rick uh, for encouraging me to give an informal talk. But, but, but we'll see where it goes. Um, this work is done with a lot of people. And I'm trying, and as you will see, failing. Uh, to pull together threads that come from a lot of places. And I just want to thank all of these various people. Um, so how many of you are familiar with r naught and the basic reproductive number? There's a little bit of a cultural gap here. OK, so almost everybody, but not quite enough that I can just skip over it. So a very fundamental idea in epidemiology and mathematical epidemiology comes from Ronald Ross, who is also the person who discovered or proved that mosquitoes transmit malaria. So a very impressive person, apparently impressively obnoxious as well. Um, <laughs> but the idea is this, that if you can estimate the mean number of new potential infections per infection, you get a good index of risk at the population level for this in infection to spread. And that there's a threshold. What Ross basically did a mathematical calculation based on this idea and said, we don't have to eliminate mosquitoes from Panama in order to make malaria go away. We have to reduce mosquito density by 80%, and it's going to go away by itself because there's going to be less than one infection per infection. So if there's 100 infections in this generation, there's going to be 80 in the next and 50 in the next, and very strongly analogous to what you people, if I can use that without offense, what many of you people would call absolute fitness. Um, another important concept is in a homogeneously mixing population, we can multiply r naught by the proportion susceptible and figure out not how many people you could infect if you were sick, but how many people you are going to infect if you're sick. Um, the idea being that if I have three potential infections, but one of you is already immune to the brand of influenza that I thoughtfully brought along with me to the meeting, I will only be able to infect the other two. And we have a fairly powerful relationship if we assume homogeneous mixing, and if we assume I can find a, out how to use the laser pointer, um, r naught predicts the proportion of the population that's going to be affected, going to be either infected or rendered immune by the action of disease at equilibrium. So I started thinking about all this because we have been um, researching canine rabies. And in fact, I'm part, a small part of a group that suggests that we can eliminate canine rabies from all species by targeting um, domestic dogs. That doesn't mean all kinds of rabies, but canine rabies is responsible for 99% of the rabies health burden on humans. And the rabies health burden on humans is substantial compared to other diseases that spread to humans primarily from animals. Rabies has the most deaths, far from the most um, total disease burden, because um, far from the most total disease burden, because almost all of the disease burden from rabies is death, whereas leishmaniasis and filariasis cause a lot of non-fatal disease. Um, I was very amused the first time I saw a picture like this. It was about neglected tropical diseases, and I had been unaware that hat was a major killer. Um, I seem to be the only person who finds this amusing. But um, <laughs> hat. Maybe the only person who knows what hat is. Or maybe the only person who does it. I mean, that's. I, may be the, uh, I thought it was funny because somebody was presenting it to me, and I was thinking about hats. Maybe I'm too hat conscious. So hat is human, Afri 
African trypanosomiasis. And I guess the point is that I do not want to leave any of you with the impression that it represents a hat that is killing <laughs> people here. I apologize. So, rabies, um, I apologize that this is a table and not a figure. R0 estimates for rabies are very narrow. And the better they get and the more systematically they're done, the narrower the range seems to be. And this is really striking. I'll focus on the two here that I know the most about, uh, the Ngorongoro district and the Serengeti district, um, which are two very different places. Uh, they're next to each other, and we chose them specifically for contrast. Serengeti is very agricultural, rural. It's what you might picture as a good place for rabies. There's homesteads and little aggregations of villages. Ngorongoro is very pastoralist. It's a kind of place that's much more strange to me than, a, than an African rural thing. And the density of people, the density of dogs, the kinds of interactions all seem to be much lower. And yet, using very similar methods, we got very similar estimates of r naught. And it's a mystery. It's a mystery that these estimates are narrow, because if you reduce the density of dogs by a factor of five, and if we've shown that dogs biting other dogs is what spreads the rabies, why would that not have a big effect on the spread of rabies? And it's a mystery that they're low. In general, I learned, I think, from Martin Novak that if you know something is bigger than something else in general, it typically means it's much bigger. right? And it's, we don't generally expect to find r naught near 1. But here we find it near 1 um, for a wide range of values. And I'm just going to take a digression and talk about this is actually, this narrow bands of r naught are a typical pattern in disease, but for a reason that doesn't seem to work for rabies, that we haven't been able to make work for rabies. So how do you measure this? How did we, me OK, how did we measure r naught in the? with contact tracing. It's amazing. Katie Hampson went out, and she got to know um, veterinary officers and, and agricultural field extension officers. And she talked to people who had been, been bitten by rabid dogs and went backwards and forwards in time and started hiring people. And she knows people. And so we've traced. And when I say we, um, I contributed to the tracing of one or two dogs, maybe by a fact, fra factor of one or two percent. So they. So there, there's, there's a, I guess I'm slipping in this direction. When I say I did something, I mean we did it. And when I say we did something, I mean, I mean they did it. So <laughs> using those definitions, um, we traced 70 or 80 percent of, of, of the rabid cases that had ever been reported. We asked people, who do you think bit your dog? Who do you think your dog bit? back, forth, up, and down. And we also have estimation methods, and it's, it's all on a paper. Um, there are other models that fit from, say, epidemic curves when something is introduced. And maybe we can go back to this just because, well, that's exciting. I've pushed a button to start the timer, but I didn't succeed in starting the timer. Um, so I don't know whether I'm ahead or behind. Oh, there you are. Um, at least I know where to look if I get too far behind. Um, so a good question, which I hope we'll have time to get back to if you remain interested. The main reason that you see patterns like this is because of heterogeneity. So a long time ago, I thought about gonorrhea and the fact that if you go around the world to big cities, you see, or you saw back when I was paying attention, prevalences of gonorrhea from about 5% to about 20% in the adult sexually active population, which if you believe the naive models, implies a very, just the same problem as rabies, a very small and narrow possible band for r naught that would give you those prevalences. In the case of gonorrhea, the answer is very well known. It's due to heterogeneity in human sexual behavior. And if you allow simply for the fact that some people are having a lot of sex and some people are having less sex. So if you imagine two populations, <coughs> normal human populations, one of which is using a lot of condoms and one of which is not using a lot of condoms, or one of which has some sort of good immune background to fight off gonorrhea and the other one doesn't. If you imagine these populations as heterogeneous, one of them is going to have a much higher prevalence of gonorrhea. In reality, human sexual behavior is one of the most highly variable things that, that a biologist can study. 
Um, and in reality, if you go to either of these places, you're going to find a fairly big group of highly sexually active people who have gonorrhea despite whether or not they're in the high-risk city or the low-risk city, and a fairly large group of low-risk people who don't have gonorrhea despite what city they're in and, and despite what they're exposed to. And so this smooths out these curves and is sort of a pervasive explanation for patterns like this, but we can't make it work for rabies. And one of the reasons is that this really works by correlations between what's going on with susceptible and what's going on with, with infectious individuals. And the key thing, which I find very interesting about rabies, and is not shared by a lot of disease, is a fundamental asymmetry in how it's spread. Right? Typically, if I have sex with you, you're having sex with me. Right? Or if you have flu, I might get it. I have flu, you might get it. But rabies doesn't work like that. Right? There's no straightforward argument that I can make whereby a dog that's more likely to give you rabies, the kind of dog that gets furious rabies and bites lots of dogs, there's no obvious reason why that dog would be more likely to get rabies. There's a fundamental asymmetry between biting and getting bitten. And there's not anything known that could explain this flattening in rabies, even though we see that kind of flattening in a lot of other diseases. Um, so I started thinking about it as an evolutionary puzzle from the point of view of the bug. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what people think about how diseases evolve. And so there's a well-established theory, which many of you have heard of, and many of you have also probably heard the refutation. So I'll apologize for the boring parts of the talk. Um, the idea that pathogens should evolve to get along with us, right? If they're not annoying us or killing us or getting our immune system too excited. We can all live and be happy together. We carry them along. That's the commensal theory. Here's a photograph of a kid with the common cold who is, seems, and feels fine. He's being carried around. He's playing with this other kid who, I'm happy to report, did not get the cold on that particular occasion. Um, and so that's one theory of how pathogens can evolve. When people started questioning this quantitatively, they came um, actually to a very pretty theory, um, which is an ecological theory of susceptibles as a resource. So the idea is, going all the way back to the curve and the idea that the number of susceptibles is going to converge at equilibrium in a well-mixed population to 1 over R0. So that means the pathogen or the pathogen strain with the highest R0 can use up almost all the susceptibles and outcompete all the other strains. There's not enough susceptibles. So this is an example of a Joshua tree. This is an example of an organism winning by drawing down the resource, in this case, water. Right? There's no trees around this tree because it's drawn down the water level with its root system to a level where nothing else can survive. And the idea of pathogen trade-off theory is susceptible to that resource. And the original idea, it's a fascinating theory because the original idea was all from the host-centered point of view. Why does the bug want or not want to kill us? And it was articulated and often referred to as the theory of virulence, a theory of how deadly or damaging diseases are. But it really works a lot better to think about it from the bug's point of view. And the bug doesn't actually care if it kills us. The bug cares or, sorry, doesn't care whether it kills us or whether we just get immune to it. The bug cares for, for how long it can sit around and make a living. And so instead of virulence, I think this is the wrong word, unfortunately. I have some guess. Um, instead of virulence, it's better to think about it in terms of how aggressively the pathogen is trying to invade your body, whether by shooting toxins at you or whether by reproducing more quickly. And the trade-off theory is fairly straightforward. Um, I think I skip very lightly over my conceptualization of R0, which is that it is the product, my conceptualization for this talk, which is the product of a transmission rate. So beta has units of one over time, and it's the rate at which I can make people sick with my flu. Right. So if I'm in a well-mixed population back at my university. Maybe I'm going to make, on average, one half of a person sick per day. And the other component 
of R0 is here tau, although I always call it D. Um, obviously, vandals have been um, editing my talk. Um, tau or D, which is a time length, right? And so beta is a half a per, an average rate or an average hazard of infecting half a person per day. And tau is I'm symptomatically infectious with the flu for four days. Um, and so the product is a unitless number, R0, which ties back to some of the other nonsense that I've been telling you. And the idea is as the pathogen gets more aggressive, it has a higher, sorry, as the pathogen gets, did I do it right? More aggressive, it has a higher average beta, right? It's replicating more, it's sending out more viruses or whatever. Um, but that saturates, right? I can't infect people who I don't see, no matter how many flu variants I have. And in fact, you could imagine a model where this turns over. I'm too sick to go around and, and, and get you sick. Um, and as the pathogen is more aggressive, it has on average a lower tau, either because it's <coughs> going to kill me or take me out of circulation, or it's going to piss off my immune system to the extent where I kill it, which to it is, again, for most pathogens, basically the same thing. And so we get R0, which is what the Joshua tree is trying to maximize, has a hump in the middle. And this could be a good starting point for thinking about why some R0 values are clustered close to 1. But like the first set of ideas I threw at you, it also doesn't work very well um, for rabies. And I'm going to take another digression. So this is a wolverine, which is a small animal which can kill uh, larger animals. And does anybody know or care to guess what this is? I wouldn't know, so there's really no reason why I should even ask you that. I know because I Googled it. In fact, I don't know. Somebody, um, this could be a, a chain of misinformation about bacteria. This is anthrax. And anthrax is a classic counterexample to what I just told you. Anthrax, ecologically speaking, is not a parasite but a predator because anthrax does not spread at all virtually ever unless it kills you. So anthrax does not have the same trade-off that we were talking about. Anthrax, as it increases its aggressiveness, it's increasing both tau, the amount of, um, sorry, as it increases its aggressiveness, it's increasing both tau, the amount of time it has a chance to expose you, and, as well as beta. Right? The idea here is that if anthrax not aggressive at night enough, it might fail to kill you, and you might have a tau of zero, and we average that in. And the point is that things that want to kill you don't have the same trade-off. Now, rabies isn't quite there. Right? Rabies spreads while you're alive, but it spreads while you're very sick. And it's not at all obvious that rabies has a downward sloping Tau. That is to say, on average, you're going to have less chance to give people rabies if the rabies just kind of chills in you. Yo. Uh, can you explain a little bit more why, so why the tau goes up as aggressiveness goes up? I mean, it seems like it's a life phase thing for anthrax. So, yeah, the idea for anthrax, and I, I stumbled over it because I hadn't thought of the problem until I got to it, um, or at least not recently. The idea for anthrax is that this is really a couple weeks of your being a carcass. People are typically thinking about antelopes in the savanna. Multiplied by the probability it's going to kill you, right? Because that's what it needs to do. So the more aggressively it spreads inside you, the higher the chance it's going to kill you, and the more bacteria you're probably going to have when it does. Um, so a lot of problems. I'm having a lot of problems with, with the, the narrow rabies r naughts and particularly those in Tanzania, because those are the ones I understand. Um, a lot of what I've told you has been based on doing OD models, which make assumptions, make assumptions that we have a lot of water molecules and that they're well mixed, right? And so up until now, I've assumed that the population is well mixed. And that's critical for this Joshua tree theory. It's critical for the idea that the pathogen that wins is going to be the one that kicks the most hosts out of the susceptible pool. Because it's easy to imagine as soon as we don't have perfect mixing, you can imagine there's a disadvantage to using up all the resources right around you. There's probably a good analogy here to um, 
human affairs and economics, which would be um, one to get into. And so I was fascinated at some point in my life when I connected my concerns about rabies and how it seems to regulate its R-naught, which I should state clearly right now, and other possibilities that we're still just wrong about the rabies are not, and it's not that narrow, but this seemed like a cool lead to pursue. People talk about how pathogens may limit their own r not, may limit, in some sense, their own short-term fitness in space through simple evolutionary processes. So I'm sorry, I, I meant to blow this up um, and make a nice PDF, but instead my computer cried. Sorry, I meant to put this at the right <laughs> scale, but my computer crashed instead and I gave up. Um, I've had a lot of adventures here, and um, I don't know how much time I have because the adventures I had failing to pull this talk together are probably more interesting than the talk. Um, so, and the two ideas that seem to flow through at least my understanding of this idea of spatially self-limiting pathogens are one, the idea that these things develop some sort of characteristic frequency, complicated spatio-temporal stuff that I don't really understand. Um, and the other is something called burnout, the idea that a pathogen that uses up all of the susceptibles in a particular um, environment or locale might go extinct because it's got no more susceptibles. So here is an example of a simple disease model, and it's a caricature of how until recently I thought about burnout. So we have, um, this is measles invading Iceland, except it's and a fake Iceland in my computer that's even smaller and more homogeneous than, than the real Iceland. And what you get, so these are the susceptibles, and what you get is a very fast and very sharp epidemic. And by the end of a few weeks in real life, in less than two weeks in fake life, um, you have virtually no susceptibles left, right? Everybody who could get measles has gotten measles. You've had this, this, this violent epidemic. And the idea, also borne out by, by measles in Iceland, is that it's then going to go extinct. Measles used to go extinct in Iceland, and now they have airplanes, so it, it doesn't. Um, although it may now again because of this other thing. Um, but <laughs> I like that I'm taking a digression from my digression. If I take unlabeled digressions, you should call me on it because it's, it, it, it's, it's a real danger. So the idea is one of the things I wanted to think about is could rabies be regulating its aggressiveness by through local burnout? Um, and we're going to come back to the ideas of burnout. We're going to come back to that picture. Oh, I meant to mention that in the simplest epidemic model, the number of susceptibles left after a violent epidemic is on the order of E to the minus R naught, right? So if measles has an R naught of 20, then you can imagine in a well-mixed model, every single person on Earth would get measles, whereas if rabies has an R naught of 2, there would still be some susceptibles left, and that might turn out to be good for the disease. So we made a, a simple model inspired very strongly by the PNAS paper that I showed you not so clearly. So we have a square grid. Sorry. We have a square grid. Everybody's got eight neighbors that they can infect. And this tau and D are synonyms in my poor little brain. This should say um, beta and D can evolve freely. So beta is the transmission rate. D is the duration of infectiousness. And we just put this thing on a lattice. Um, and the first thing we do, because it's what the people who came up with this idea. So I'd like to stress, A, that everything, I'm, some of the stuff I'm going to show you in the next few minutes is, is pretty cool. But it's mostly us replicating and maybe slightly generalizing what was already done. I'm just trying to, to, to understand it. Um, the coolest stuff was, was definitely known before I came along. But if you provide the thing with fixed time courses, meaning that if I get rabies today, I, there's some characteristic time of infectiousness, and I'm going to follow it exactly. If I'm supposed to be sick for 1.3 days, I'm going to be sick for 1.3 days. And if I'm supposed to be resistant, or if my cell is supposed to be resistant before some other dog is recruited by the family for two months, then resistance is going to last for exactly two months. So that's what I mean by fixed time course. Um, 
And what happens is something that's absolutely remarkable, which is you introduce the disease at some barely able to scrape by level. And of course, both beta, the infectiousness, and tau, the duration of infectiousness, increase. And then, for no obvious reason, we put no trade-offs or nothing into the model, tau suddenly turns around and endogenously, endogenously excuse me, decides to get smaller. Um, and it does so in such a way that R0 is regulated to a characteristic value. Um, and this value is going to depend on the details of the lattice or the network that you put it on. And it seems really cool, and I don't understand it. So one of the many adventures I had in trying to prepare this talk um, was that we had some movies of this process. And I'm colorblind, and the movies were supposed to have color, but the color parameters were set wrong. And I kept asking people to help me identify color patterns. And some of the people were able to identify color patterns, even though they were not present. And this turned into a very large um, and confusing thing. So at 4 o'clock this morning, I, I decided That's to give up. What? That's big data for you. Yeah. At 4 o'clock this morning, I, I had given up in the interest of my own sanity. And then at 4 o'clock this morning, I got up and I made um, a PDF fake movie. Um, <laughs> so let's see. So this is what, I don't know, what do you do at 4 in the morning? Um, so this is what the thing is doing. With fixed time courses, um, it evolves to have these waves. So what you're seeing here, um, the black cells are resistant. They can't get sick. The blue cells are susceptible. Um, and the non-black or blue cells are the range of evolving uh, pathogens, which are occupying hosts. I always think about the bug first. It's a big problem. Um, and the color is like a heat map. White are the faster pathogens, which are the ones, um, I guess, I guess the ones that are favored more than we expected. An easier way to say it. Red are the ones that should be fitter. And what I've done is I've color coded from red to white sort of based on this quasi equilibrium. So it's, it has to go from red to white. So and the fitness here is R0? Yeah. Okay. So R0, but even more, there's no trade off in this model. Ah, one other thing. To simplify this, I froze beta. So here we're now froze beta. So everybody's got the same infections. The only difference between the red and the white is that the red are infectious for longer. So in any simple model you could conceptualize, the red are just going to spread out and take over the white. But in reality, they have these insane patterns with these vortices. And you can spend a long time looking at them, I think, and not understand them. You can certainly spend a long time looking at them and not understanding them if the colors are not there. Um, but now they <laughs> definitely are. And um, we can come back to, to, to these patterns maybe if we have time. But Sorry, yes. The red is longer duration yes. The, the, yeah. The red should be winning um, and is not. In fact, they're at quasi equilibrium. Yo. I'm just a little bit confused about what we're looking at here. Since you said the black are, are immune. Yeah. So why is it that the black are? The black turn blue. And this with the fixed time course, you get these very regular waves. So the black turn blue just in time to get eaten. You, the, oh, oh, I see, I see. Thank you. Oh, OK. Um, so yeah, a lot of confusion going on. Where is my talk? It disappeared. <laughs> is that it? Have you seen the uh, Ben Kerr's experiments with phage? I'm going to save that until the question period, but I can, I can give away that the answer is no. Um, <laughs> so we did these experiments, and they have, they have these traveling ways, and it seems very fragile. I was looking for burnout. I wasn't looking 
for perfect spatial synchronicity because I've been to Serengeti district and it's not in fact a square lattice, right? Um, and so when we first did these experiments, here's where it all devolves into chaos in case it wasn't um, chaotic enough before. Um, when we first did these experiments, it seemed very fragile. It seemed to depend on the fixed time course. Um, but when I was trying to review and sort of do everything carefully and marshal my thoughts for this talk, I find that actually you can get this phenomenon with non-ridiculous um, parameters in terms of variation. So here SD log is the standard sigma parameter for the log normal distribution. And as we increase SD log, um, this phenomenon goes away. So at first I was not interested in it. But it doesn't go away super fast. So we have, even for an SD log of two, we have something that looks qualitatively like the same phenomenon. And if I have time and there's interest, I'll show you that movie, um, which I literally created between 9 and 9.30 this morning. Because if, if I hadn't thought my talk would start at 9, I wouldn't have had that movie. Which I thought was funny. Um, so so the, um, the, the time course is? Time course. You're assuming it's um, log normal. Both time courses are log normal. With, with this is one parameter and what's the other one? The other parameter is roughly what's evolving. So we have, um, we fix the recalcitrant period, um, and then the other two time parameters are evolving. Um, and so here, beta has units one over time. And then the duration is just in units of the, the recalcitrant period. But the log normal will have two parameters. Yeah, this, this, this is, is the this other parameter. Oh, and in the other case, it's one. Okay. Oh. And that's, that's the thing that's evolving. That's, that's the key. Um, so what we've done is we've taken these fixed time periods, we've kept everything the same, and we've just smoothed them, smushed them out, the opposite smooth. Um, and again, qualitatively similar. And then as you increase um, the variance, it just poof, disappears, and you get a very sharp phase transition to chaos and to something that looks like a lot of local burnout. So it's all, to me, very interesting. Um, and I'll try to tie this all together. It's also come in my mind together with other thoughts about how and when burnout occurs. Um, and questions, as you were asking, about these time distributions. So the conventional wisdom has to do with what I show you, that big, it's very appealing. And it seems to be largely but not entirely wrong. And I'm part of the conventional wisdom. This is a paper um, that I was involved in and that's, that's been influential. The conventional wisdom is these big epidemics tend to lead to burnout. Um, this is a paper where we claim to show that with some simulations. Although at the time, and again in retrospect, the most surprising thing about these is not that we were able to show what we already believed, but how narrow some of our little pictures of how reducing the effect of R0 can increase pathogen um, persistence. What's really surprising is how narrow some of these um, windows are. But anyway, we published this, and we claimed, and people believe, that this is a mechanism for how zoonotic diseases get established. Thank you. That a zoonotic disease, this is Nipah virus, that we said it probably had to jump to pigs several times. Because the first time it jumped to pigs, it probably burned out. And the second time, it was probably more likely to persist. That may be true, but it's not true in the simple way that we thought. Just recently, David Earn decided that people hadn't done this systematically enough. And he and I and about 10 other people um, went back and did sort of the simplest possible simulations you can do. And we found the opposite. We found that increasing R0 always increases your probability that a disease is going to invade, sort of the opposite of this conventional wisdom. And if you look at it, and if you look at the SDE, we shouldn't be so impressed by how big this peak is and by how low this trough of susceptibles are. What people tend not to notice is that, at least in this simple model, 
The infectious individuals don't necessarily reach a low trough. And the fact is that if you're a pathogen and you need to survive the winter, loosely speaking, that is to say the period of time after you've burned out all your hosts, it doesn't matter that to you that much if there's one in a hundred or one in a thousand or one in a hundred thousand susceptible hosts at the trough. What matters is how long it takes those hosts to recover back to where you're going to be able to make a living again. And that depends on R0 in the other direction, right? So if I have an R0 of 3, I might leave 1 in 20 susceptible hosts, giving me an effective R of 3 over 20. But then I have to wait a third of the recalcitrant period to make a living. If I have an R0 of 20, I get down to no susceptible hosts. But unless I'm absolutely killing all of them, I only have to wait 1 20th of the recalcitrant period, and I'm back in business. And that intuition that I just gave you produces, with two equations, um, a picture that looks like this and does a suspiciously good job of matching this picture. And I happen to know that there was no cheating involved, so you can choose to or not to take my word for it. Um, in the interest of time, I'll skip lightly over what I think, since I don't understand anything about how the time distributions might play into this, right? So until now, like the best understood results are those from Van Balagoyen, who uses an absolutely fixed time period, and from David Earn, who does the opposite. He's using a purely exponential time period for everything, and they can play a lot of games in between those areas. So I feel like I've left, thank you, the problem of these rabies, the mystery of, the, of these rabies are nots, um, beautifully intact. I don't even know if it's evolutionary, but I do want to make one final suggestion. I like pursuing the evolutionary path. I th again, I thank Rick for sort of like making me get my head in order at everybody else's expense. Um, but another thing that occurs to me trying to do it, it may be evolution operating at a wider scale. So here are the best rabies data that we could collect from all of Africa about five or 10 years ago. And here's a model in which we purported to show that the time scale of rabies fluctuation is best explained by people panicking and then not panicking. There's no way to get these things to go as fast as they look like they go if not for the fact that when you have a rabies epidemic, people react to it. And that could conceivably be an evolutionary pressure at a bigger, time, at a bigger spatial scale than I've been able to think about or measure, and I often think about, I'll, I'll drop this partly because Katya is here, I often think about um, influenza and all this airborne, vi airborne virus surveillance, right? So when H1N1 came out, Ontario stopped certain people from entering Ontario, and at the time it seemed ridiculous because I knew and Katya knew that, flu was going, that that flu was going to sweep the globe. The question that occurred to me later is if you stop the people with the fever and the cough from getting off the airplane, does that give the milder flus a chance to get to Ontario before the worst flus do? And is that a way in which we're affecting pathogen evolution when we're not even trying to? And my time is up, so thank you for your patience. I did not mean to do that. Do we have time for questions? These patterns in the simulation that, that, that you showed, uh, they seem rather typical of sort of cyclical cellular automata, right? I mean, these sort of spiral patterns. Yes, the I've spiral seen patterns look typical to a lot of people. I'm not an expert in the area. Um, but yeah, I would love to know how you get those vortices and why there seem to be patterns that, basically what it looks like to me, now that I've been able to see the colors for the last 12 hours, um, what it looks like to me is that the whites that is to say, the slower, nominally less fit ones are somehow staying inside the vortices, and the things are getting red as they move away and, and eventually annihilate themselves in the susceptibles. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to know so more about recently, it. And this has been studied a lot in, in the context of what, what people call rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, uh, so I have read those papers. So you have sort of three species that have this sort of cyclical dominance, and then you, you get you know, patterns that, that look exactly like that. So I think there must be some, you know, some structure like that in your right. system. Right, and, and of course, in some sense, that's what we want to get away from, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever's artifactual or very specific is, is, is less what I'm interested in. Um, although, I'm not sure I'm going to achieve that laudable goal. So.
following up on your remark, I, I think you can get these patterns even without the heterogeneity. I think it's more that the, the time to come back to being susceptible is pretty slow. And I think that forces the thing to make these wave patterns in order to cope with them. If it came back more quickly, then you could get some random mess. But you know, it sort of has to organize itself because it takes a long time to go back from the removed to the susceptible. And because of this regularity that the blues, I mean, in this case, it's super clear and, and looks very artifactual. You know, that I'm getting susceptible, like, just as I'm about to get infected, I become susceptible so that it works. Um, and what's interesting to me is if I could find, um, so is this going to work? So this one is much less smooth but still seems to work. So this is the one with uh, the log sigma or whatever I'm supposed to call it of 0 0.2, which until recently we thought didn't work. And it's still possible that we were right before and wrong. Now, but you can see it's messier and yet still seems to generate the vortices. But I think a good point is I'd love to understand the vortices. I'm not ever going to do as well as the people who do that for a living. What I really want to understand is why it's ever good to be white and why when it's good to be white, it's, it's right there in the vortex. And I think as you approach this phase transition, you see um, a burnout, sort of burnout, sort of sweeps the world. It might really, I mean, this might really turn out to relate to, 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 to biology. Yeah? The whites didn't really seem to take over here. The whites can't take over because I've colored it. So that it's a spec this is a this is a quasi equilibrium. I've colored it so that I have a range from white to red. Um, you you can look at it sort of together with the time course and you'll see that it went well. No, you can't. You, you, can, you can take both. <laughs> um, for this beta, this is this is the range. And the point being, of course, that what you would expect is for the reds to take over and to get redder and redder and redder if I let them but, but they don't. But the color map is the same across images. No. The color map is not the same across images. The color map is tuned to the image so that I can see what's going on in that image. And then sort of a relative today. color map, right? Yeah. Sort of changing with time. So I can tell you exactly what it is. Pure red it's not, is... It's not changing with time. It's constant with time. In constant with time. Because it's yes. already letting go to equilibrium. That's... Well, and, because, and because I make it constant with time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But not between images. Yeah. Would there be any points of looking at um, motion of hosts? In other words, a yes. site moves and takes its Yes, that's direction. that's absolutely one of the next things to do. The other thing to do, which we've started, is to deregularize the network a little bit. The big problem with deregularizing the network is that you don't get such nice pictures, and that's one one reason to do motion instead. I wonder whether you can understand this kind of um, uh, long term trend of not increasing in D, um, you know, but mm -hmm. actually it remaining pretty low by not only considering kind of what the R naught is of an individual, but what, what, its, what its offsprings uh, R naught values are. So you can imagine that um, in this setting, you know, you have, let's say you have one, uh, two pathogens, one that has a longer duration of infection, the other one with a shorter duration of infection. The one with longer duration of infection would have an immediately a higher R naught, right? Mm -hmm. so say, well, it will be better, right? But if you look at their <coughs> offspring, this is in a spatial setting, right? Basically, the offspring, this high one, might not actually, you know, might burn itself kind of, or surround itself by kind of recoveries and so forth. So basically, its offspring have lower, not r naught, but R's. No, you're right. Right? Um, and whereas the other one, so basically, if you take kind of a, um, almost like a kin selection sort of, or basically like no, a No, people have done exactly like, this. People have transgenerational have... sort of. People, you know, I sort of came to this backwards because I was starting with, you know, rabies ecology and I've sort of been drifting into this direction. But people have done and had big arguments about it. Wilson and Wilson, the, the famous controversial paper, they dipped into this and now people are attacking them. So, uh, yes, is, is, is the answer. People do kin selection, <laughs> but I don't know if anybody's done this sort of grandchildren are effective thing, which I like. So, could, go ahead. could be specific to having those waves turns out that such altruistic yeah. behavior is, is, is not unlikely to evolve in the presence of, of waves. 
Right. And, and that's, the, I mean, that's the big question in my mind is how fragile it is. And when I thought it was a little more fragile, when I thought that it broke even here, I had a whole different talk, which is, you know, this is an artifact. And, but the more I tried to nail down that it's fragile in the last couple of weeks, the more I got confused and then I took that loop through the burnout thing, which just happened to be going on at the, at the, at the same time. I think you need long waves, as long as you have those waves. Okay, we Probably. Can take, we can take or something one. else to provide spatial structure. I'm sorry. <coughs> Last question. Go ahead. There's a quick comment on what Katya said. I mean, sometimes in these social network models, you have, especially for sexually transmitted diseases, you have people with higher sexual activity preferentially sort of attached to other people with them. I think so. I think that might mimic what you were suggesting. Okay. Well, let's thank the speaker.